to Story and Things, a podcast where we review stories and talk about oh. things. I'm sorry, this is the second one. Beer? We've been drinking. <laughs> I've been drinking. I've been drinking. Oh, thank you. oh my, my god! god. <laughs> Didn't know we had a star karaoke edition. <laughs> Not even. I'm sorry, this isn't Punk 57. Oh, I... but that was fun, though. We should do that again. You know, we should do an episode. We should do a karaoke episode. No. Yeah, okay. I'm hearing a lot of yes in that no, so we'll go back to it. And then we should do, we should do an ASMR episode. No. Where, where we talk about a story we hate, but in whispers. <laughs> Wouldn't what? that be funny, though? Which story comes to mind? <laughs> through because I kind of hurt myself <laughs> but uh-huh. you know but the whole time we have to like whisper how much we fucking hate it you know I don't like whispering it makes me feel uncomfy <laughs> but wouldn't it be wait fun? but we should say what wouldn't story we said though I just said Penelope Douglas <laughs> but w- what we mean is Punk 57 I was thinking about her other one <gasps> birthday girl yeah what if we did though wouldn't that well, be funny we haven't read it though so what if I love it we have to find the story we know we hate it can be like one of our old ones, like I don't know, top of my head, Bridgerton. You know, <laughs> <That> <laughs> one of our old ones, and then us just we can't laugh, oh. and we have to stay quiet. Wouldn't that be funny? And that could be like our April Fools' episode. Wait, I do love that. Wait, okay. I love that. Yeah. We should do that. I don't like ASMR though. But it's funny. It's not that funny. Really funny. Stop it. Because we'll be like, Daphne's such a bitch. Don't you agree? won't really be able to hear each other. I can hear you. I can hear you. But I can't hear you, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've been waiting for this episode. For a while now. I have. Mm-hmm. Uh, I read this book in Arizona. Mm-hmm. And then I decided this book doesn't make any fucking sense. So I reread it. And let me just say, you sometimes it. it hits the second time. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to be talking about Gideon the Ninth by Tamsin Muir. And and it's very dense. It's super dense. So good luck. <laughs> so I am gonna summarize it, but I did also want to say because it's such a dense book, we're not gonna get through all the specifics of the plot. More so, just discussing certain aspects of it. Mm-hmm. So I do recommend you read it if you want to understand what we're talking about. Yeah, because we will not touch everything. There's no way. No. We won't have enough time. No, this would be hours and hours long. <laughs> Raised in servitude mm-hmm. to the ninth house, oh. Gideon is asked to abandon her crappy life and afterlife because there's fucking skeletons walking around here, bitch, <laughs> um, to aid a necromancer who is named Harrow Hark, the reverend daughter of the ninth house, who has been summoned by the emperor to train to be a lictor at Cannon House, which is the surviving structure left of the first house. Mm. So basically, to say that in an easier way, our main character Gideon is asked to be a knight to help a necromancer. And because Gideon's life is already crappy, she's like, I bet. (laughs) She's more so forced into it. She is forced into it. So Gideon and Harrow travel to a haunted gothic palace in space where Harrow's training is meant to commence. We come across several necromancers and cavaliers, which are the knights, from the first through eighth house, who are also shooting for the same goal, to be a lictor. With not much guidance, they are working towards the goal until the necromancers and lictors start freaking dropping like flies, (laughs) dying left and right. No one knows what it takes to be a lictor, but our characters are destined to find out or die trying. So, oh, suspense. (laughs) So that's my summary. Oh, that's Um, it? It's very spoiler free because there's a lot going on in this story. So go fucking listen or read this book. Here, here. I'll give you my audible password. (laughs) Go (laughs) check it on the screen. All right, here, 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 here. Don't put it. Please don't put it. Please don't put it. I don't make that much coin. (laughs) But anyway, it's a very dense story. So go listen to it because we are just going to spoil parts. Like I said, we're not talking about the entire story because... To be honest, it's been like a while since I've read this and not everything stuck. So yeah, I will try my best to explain it. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the tropes that were in this story. 
And tell me how you feel about these types of tropes, because I feel like it is going to play into our final rating. <laughs> okay. One of these tropes is my girl Aggie Christie. My girl Aggie Christie, a famous trope that was created because of one of her books called And Then There Were None. So this is oh, based... I didn't know that was a whole trope. This is based off of the famous Agatha Christie book, And Then There Were None, where they go to... Is it like a beach? It's a murder mystery, pretty much, and it's like Clue. You're trying to figure out who committed the murder, but they start slowly dropping one by one, mm-hmm. and then, hence the title, And Then There Were None. Can I tell you, I've never been into mystery books. I love that book. I know, I know you do. I, I remember you book. telling me in um, high school yeah, that I, you loved it so I read much. it in middle school, I think. I. It's been a minute since I read it, so if it's not good anymore, okay? I'm sorry. <laughs> but... I liked it at the time. <laughs> I'm like defending myself. <laughs> I have been meaning to read it again, though. I, I've been wanting to read it because I know it's a good book. I've never been a fan of mystery, but it's because I don't really seek it out. And also, my one brain cell is freaking <laughs> trudging along on her exercise bike. She can't solve for shit. She can't solve these riddles. <laughs> so the reason I'm assuming that this is a trope is because this book has a murder mystery aspect to it. Mm-hmm. We're trying to figure out why people are dropping like flies. Yes, we are. And it's the entire story. Mm-hmm. And it's hard, you know, when you think it's someone, that person ends up fucking dying. Yeah. So there's a lot going on with that trope. Did, do you like that trope? I didn't mind it in this story. I did like the the aspect of the murder mystery in the story when it started to get deeper in and they started to kill characters I liked. Yeah, that was sad. Another trope is the fake it till you make it trope, which is fake your... Talents? Fake, fake your talents to make it to the end. Because Gideon had to change her entire fighting style. To, to look like she was a cavalier. Exactly. Because she wasn't a cavalier. Uh, Harrowheart's cavalier was her brother. And he just ended up freaking leaving. <laughs> he was coddled as a child. And Harrow's mom was like, you can't take my boy away. <laughs> so no, I say no to this. Uh-huh. And that's when Harrow ends up coercing Gideon to be the cavalier. Because she can't go without the cavalier. Yep. Another trope, and this is the one where I'm like, mm, is enemies to lovers. Lovers. So that's <laughs> what's interesting about this book. This book is considered an enemies to lovers, but but there's also a lot of, con- not controversy, there's a lot of arguments with that because they also consider this an LGBTQ book. But nothing really happens happens. between the two main characters who are portrayed very well as enemies, Mm -hmm. but not lovers. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would agree with that sense unless something would have solidified their relationship together. I wouldn't consider that. There was literally no crumb. This is enemies to, I'm still your enemy, but we work in the same area, so (laughs) I'll be your friend for a bit. (laughs) Acquaintance. I was going to say enemies to, I guess I tolerate you now. Yeah, exactly. So another one that I didn't know was a trope is bathtub bonding. What is bathtub bonding? Exactly what it sounds like. We bond in the bathtub? Wait, I actually do love moments like that. Yeah. There's something so vulnerable about two people being in a bathtub. I love that you said that. You right now and my mind, my one brain cell, are one and one have become two. (laughs) Are you saying I only have one brain cell? (laughs) So anyway, (laughs) the the reason why I like this, I didn't even realize this was a trope, but it's, it's apparently rooted in Japanese media. So anime, manga, Mm, where baths are supposed to show vulnerability. So when you're in a bath, you're naked and you take off not only your clothes, but your status socially. Mm -hmm. So it shows vulnerability. And usually in these moments, we see both characters bond and strip away what they once were while talking about intimate moments, which push their relationship forward. And there is one scene we will talk about that is bath to bonding. And that was a very good scene to Mm me. And the last trope is buried your gaze which we've talked about enough 
Actually, we've only talked about it once, I think. But we do bring it up a lot. Yeah. Barrier gaze is anytime there's LGBTQ representation in a book, it never really it's, ends happy because one ends up dying. It's always like a sacrifice. It's always depicted as, oh, well, death is a beautiful thing. So one of them is going to die. So those are all the tropes I have written down. And I think I don't want to talk about every fucking character in this book. There's I'm sorry. So many characters, but there's a lot. Damn. So I cannot keep track of all of them. <laughs> there is only two that I want to talk about right now, and it is our two main characters. The first main character I want to talk about is Gideon. So, what are your thoughts on Gideon? So, my thoughts on Gideon from the very beginning, the writing style is really different from what I'm used to. Gideon is probably the most sassy protagonist I've ever read yep but it was really interesting i did enjoy seeing how she dealt with things and seeing her having to change her fighting style just to be harrow's cavalier and even in that moment when harrow tried to do her own thing because when they reached the first house yeah they separated and she was doing her own thing and i think she was trying to find a key and gideon they don't get along, but she was like, you know what? I'm here for a reason, so... <laughs> <laughs> so Gideon's over here. And by the way, Harrow had written, like, a note to Gideon. Oh, like, yeah. Don't fucking talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And she's like, can you put your face paint on adequately? Like, she underlined it and everything. Her, the note that she left her was so passive-aggressive. It was so funny. And she was just like, don't even look for me, okay? Just stay there. But isn't it kind of funny <laughs> that even though Gideon didn't talk to anyone, because Gideon always wore her hood and had her makeup on, and she had fucking sunglasses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so people, like, you know, she's over here sitting, eating fucking, like, five meals at once, mm. and people just sit next to her and be they're like, fucking trust you <laughs> I trust it you was so random <laughs> it was so random because it's not like she had to do anything no. she would just be there and they'd be like let me tell you my whole life story <laughs> and it, it was built on the fact that when they were doing a training like they, they were all just practicing dueling together mm-hmm. Gideon won her first fight in like a second. Yeah. That's all it took. So people were like, oh, fuck. Oh my god, damn, girl. Yeah. Who is she? <laughs> Wait, but before we say even more, yeah. the way that they described how she survived that whole poisoning as a baby, god yeah. damn, they literally killed a whole 200. 200 babies and they like put i think it was like poisonous gas or something right and she survived by the grace of god who knows how she survived but i think she was also closest to the gas yeah i just loved that whole situation because it was it said a lot about her character yeah she's a survivor she is a survivor thank you destiny's child (laughs) destiny's one child (laughs) gideon and hero okay destiny's children i did like gideon The only thing that threw me off, like I would agree with everything you just said. Mm -hmm. The only thing that threw me off at times was her humor. She is really funny. Like there is one scene close to the very beginning of the book Mm -hmm. after her and Harrow start working together Mm -hmm. where Harrow's unable to see one part of the labyrinth that they're trying to go through. Harrow's like, we got to do this. So you just go look over there and just tell me what you see. And Gideon's like, okay, whatever. So she goes over and she looks and anytime that Harrow stands on basically like a button, there's a huge skeleton that materializes Mm -hmm. and then after a second breaks away. So then Gideon is like, oh my gosh, I know what I have to do. And she goes to Harrow and she's like, throw me in there. I'm going to fight it. And, you know, Harrow's like, what's the reason? (laughs) He's like, skeleton hands look like big swords. Oh yeah. I'm going to fight it. It's like, is that really all you can come up with that it looked like swords so you're gonna fight a fucking skeleton <laughs> and even like throughout like Gideon talking to other people there was this one specific fight where she was fighting and there was like a bunch of skeletons helping her mm. and just like to the bad guy she's just like we do bones bitches <laughs> it's yeah. like oh my god that's that. so fucking gold the only thing is that sometimes it felt like the humor threw me off mm-hmm. only because the humor was written 
as if it was written in old time English, but mm. she was making modern time jokes. Oh yeah, so I, I see what you mean. I really hated because the the writing threw me off at the beginning. I had to reread the beginning twice, like the first fifty pages twice, mm-hmm. because it was like, oh, back in in the house. Where the nuns lived and this and this. And then here's Gideon like, I'll send you a picture of a tit. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, that's that was very oddly placed. Yeah. That's the only thing that threw me off. But I think Gideon as a character was really interesting. I liked her. Like you said, she was sassy. And I just feel like she complimented our second character really well. Yeah. I agree. Can I just say one line? Yeah. That I just think encompasses her entire fucking character. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is an ebook, so it's on page 133 out of 389. Okay. But it says, Gideon rolled her eyes so hard that she felt in danger of twisting the optic nerve. <laughs> she <laughs> stupid. Can you imagine? It's like, whoa. Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> whoa. Um, what did you think about Harrow's character? Oh, yeah. So, Harrow, the Reverend's daughter, is an interesting character. Just to mention, because like I said, we're just going to kind of mention little things, not the whole story. They live in the ninth house at the beginning of the story, and they've lived there their entire life. Mm -hmm. And the ninth house is currently going extinct, basically. Yeah. There was a death of 200 children. Not Gideon, though. Fucking Russian survived that shit. (laughs) She's a survivor. I remember that. But because of that, there's really only Gideon, Harrow, and Harrow's little brother. Orpheus, I think. I don't remember his name. I think that's right. Okay, but there's not even Harrow's parents. So mm-hmm. remember, Harrow's a necromancer. So it's revealed later in the story that her parents did commit suicide because Harrow had done something that was not allowed to be done in the ninth house. Mm-hmm. But she brought them back to life and animated them basically in order to continue to have the two rulers in the front. Which, by the way, kind of freaked me out at the fact that when Harrow left, she talked to her people of the Ninth House and said, while I'm away, both the king and queen are going to be like doing their business so they won't be around. Mm -hmm. And until it's revealed that both of them are dead, like it was brought up, but until it's revealed that both of them are dead, the fact that they're probably in a room dead is really sad. It's a scary image. It is. Harrow's character. I think I like her more than I like Gideon. Mm. And the thing is, I don't... Would you call her morally gray? Yeah. Kind she of. Is, I right? think so, yeah. Because it is revealed that the death of the 200 children, minus Gideon, <laughs> <laughs> was caused by the king and queen of the ninth house. Mm-hmm. And Harrow knew about it. I don't know what they were doing. It was wasn't like a it, giant sacrifice. Wasn't was it? it also to benefit Harrow? Yeah, so that she could be the best necromancer. Exactly. And Harrow knew this. And the fact that Gideon didn't die freaked everyone out. Mm -hmm. And that kind of solidified the type of uh, character that Harrow was, which was a character jealous of Gideon to the point of hate. Mm -hmm. And Harrow's very complex in the way that you want to like her sometimes, and then she'll do things like, oh, Gideon, you're forced to go with me. I know you were trying to escape because you were basically imprisoned imprisoned here. in the ninth house, but mm-hmm. I made it so your train's gone. Oh, so that was sad. That was really messed up. Or just not really caring about Gideon, not talking to her, being very to herself. Mm-hmm. And when all the murders start happening, showing no remorse for the people who are dying. Mm-hmm. And Gideon starts caring about a character who, I don't remember their name. And the Seventh House um, yes. necromancer. Yes, she starts really caring about this character. And Harrow shows almost like possessiveness towards Gideon. But not even because she's showing that she loved her or anything. But it was more so like, Gideon, you can't get distracted. So, yep. can you not? Can you not talk to this character whose name I can't remember right now because there's so many freaking characters in this book. Wait, give me a second because I do want to know the name. Dulcinea. Dulcinea. She was the seventh house necromancer. Right, and so she was a sickly character, and so Gideon was getting close to her, and Harrow was pissed about it. Mm -hmm. But again, not because she was showing, oh my god, I care about you, I love you, but it's more of a... You're my cavalier. You're my cavalier, so I need you to focus. Mm-hmm. So I also had a love-hate relationship, relationship, 
Sorry. Whoa. I, I was in the news here. <laughs> I know. I I also had a love hate feeling towards Harrow. She is really interesting, and sometimes she was a little bit more complex than Gideon. But I just didn't. I just didn't like a lot of things that she did. So now that we've talked about both of our characters, I do want to talk about the relationship together. Mm. But I do want to know what you thought about the world building in this mm. book. Because it's very dense. You know, it's really dense. It was a lot. I am going to be honest with you and everyone listening. I don't think I really understood everything. But I did really appreciate that the author wrote like a key in the beginning mm-hmm. of the book. Because while they were talking about the different houses, and also the different houses did have different um, focuses and different yes. personalities mm-hmm. to them. So I could recognize like, oh, this is a different house. Or this is a different place. Mm-hmm. I did like the world building. There was just a lot in this book that I don't think I grasped everything. And you know what? If you have the physical copy, I don't know if it was in the ebook, but the physical copy even has a dictionary in the back to define all of the words used in this book that you wouldn't know. Oh, as that's well helpful. as like all of the names of the characters introduced and a little synopsis of them. <laughs> to mention about Gideon again. You did say she's a very sassy character, but some would even say that she is rude. She is rude. She's mean. She is rude. She's snarky. How do you feel about having an unlikable character as the narrator of the book? And when did you find yourself sympathizing for her, if you did? I don't think she was an unlikable character for me, personally. I do agree with you that sometimes it, it was a bit much, but I thought her humor made everything more interesting. Seeing her reaction to all of the things that she had to do with Harrow and, you know, just on her own made it more interesting. When did I start sympathizing with her? When she started showing that she actually felt guilty about the loss of Harrow's parents. Because she knew, right? Like, she knew that they were going to commit suicide or something like that. So she basically, to explain that, Gideon saw that Harrow was sneaking into something that she wasn't supposed to. And she told Harrow's parents what Harrow was doing. Right. And Gideon felt so proud of herself. She was like, I saw Harrow go in there because they just called her. I'm going to wait out here because I want to see Harrow's face when she gets in trouble. But realizes that Harrow is not coming out. Mm -hmm. So Gideon decides to go in there and she sees that the worker, the king and queen have hung themselves while Harrow, little baby child, Mm -hmm. is standing there with the noose not being able to do it Mm. and Gideon felt so guilty yeah I do like her as a character she's not a perfect character and I think that's what makes her such a great character Mm -hmm. because we also experience her trusting in people so we experience (laughs) her like with the whole Dulcinea Dulcinea yeah with her just being like, because by the way, Dulcinea's not a good character. Oh my god, spoiler alert. <laughs> She's not, she ends up being not a good character, but it's funny because when that hits, Gideon's like, that's the girl I had hot for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that part was so funny because she was right next to Harrow too, and they were hiding behind like a rock, I think, and she was like, oh, I almost like slept with her. I would have, I would have gone. Oh my All out with her. <laughs> to be honest. I was ready to give her my inheritance. <laughs> her Get my sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> just the sunglasses. So the moment that really just solidified Gideon being such a great fucking character and a great narrator for this story. I, I knew I liked her. But the moment where I loved her mm-hmm. was the bathtub scene. Mm-hmm. And in the bathtub scene, it's basically the first time her and Harrow are having a heart-to-heart talk. Mm-hmm. And they've been through a lot together, but they haven't really become friends at this point. So they both go into the bathtub, and that's where Harrow reveals to Gideon the death of the 200 children. They mm-hmm. both come to terms with the death by suicide of both of the parents and Harrow does say, like, I didn't hate you for that. More, I was more so mad at myself than I was mad at you. And the reason that I didn't talk to you and was a bitch mm-hmm. was because I was jealous yeah. of you. And they get closer at this point. But there's one freaking line that is supposed to be said between Cavalier and Necromancer before they start working together. 
which is one flesh, one end. Meaning that they are together till the very fucking end. Mm -hmm. And that didn't mean much to me the first time I read it. Yeah. But going back and looking at that, that was a really sweet scene. And even even right after, the fact that Gideon was like, you know, I was sleeping by the freaking windows because I didn't want to sleep in the bed that was next to yours. But right after, she like goes over to Harrow and they just get closer. And it just shows like, even though she's, kind of mean Mm -hmm. she's rude she's still a good person Mm -hmm. so i I think as a narrator gideon did a pretty good job yeah i agree i really like that moment too between them i just kind of wish that it would have been a little bit more than just that than just that what would you have liked for them to actually maybe become friends at this point yeah I kind of wish a little bit of Gideon would have rubbed off on Harrow and Shone. You know yeah, what I mean? that would have been really cute. So what are your thoughts on Gideon and Harrow as their relationship develops throughout the book? Because remember, it is said to be an LGBTQ book because Harrow and Gideon are said to be into each other. Well, but, they're also both lesbians, right? Yeah. But... What do you think about their relationship throughout the book and in general? Well... In the beginning, I thought the animosity that they had against each other was hilarious. I thought that the the dialogue was so funny between them. Like, they were so petty with each other that I thought it was a good start to what their relationship was. But then when they were forced to work together and how difficult it was, I was still there. I was still, still there. there. But I kept waiting for something to happen. I kept... I held my breath. <laughs> I was waiting for something to happen where it would show, oh, wait, they actually never hated each other. They were just jealous of each other or they were just insecure to actually reveal how they truly felt about each other because it does say lesbians in the front and I have seen that people ship them together and I know that doesn't always indicate that something happens, Yeah. but for an LGBTQIA plus book, I would have expected something to happen. Yeah. So I was really disappointed that their relationship didn't progress in the way that I think would have made this story better. It just didn't satisfy you. It did not, no. Okay. I really wish there would have been something between them because I was also there for the whole thing. And it just really hurt because at the end of the book, at the last fight, when they fight the, the big bad. The big bad. Who, by the way, was the killer between the entire thing. It was Dulcinea. Can, Can you, you believe it? The that- one... Bitch! <laughs> the one who was sick the entire time? Mm, it was that bitch. She's not sick. I'm sick of her lies. <laughs> she is sick. She's actually very sick. When she turned into... Because she was a lictor. Yeah, when she turned into a lictor, she took on whatever health state she was at, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know. She was sick for some reason. <laughs> but when the ending happened and they're fighting the big bad at the end, they're fighting Dulcinea... They never revealed what it takes to be a lictor. And Harrow Hart, this whole journey that they were going on, and, you know, there were other cavaliers and their necromancers, they were all trying to become lictors, but they were doing, like, trials, and nobody knew what it actually took to become one until literally the last moment. And the last moment is Harrow made, uh, like, a little ball of bones because she's a necromancer a ball of bones to like as a shield Uh while the lictor dulcinea is just banging down on it trying to break it there is another character camille who's very hurt and then gideon who can't really do much at this moment and harrow who is running out of energy Mm -hmm. and at this moment gideon realizes like one flesh one end Mm -hmm. like you know harrow to be fucking honest with you I don't even care about that ninth shit or anything. The reason I ever have done anything in my life has Mm -hmm. always been for you. And she says, I know what I must do. You have to open the barrier or open the shield. And she opens it. And Gideon, who has never cared about anything, screams out for the ninth Mm -hmm. and throws herself into basically like a pit of spikes Yeah, and dies. And at this moment... Harrow becomes a lictor. Yep. <laughs> How'd you feel about that? 
you know, they kind of hinted at whatever, whatever it took to become a lifter would have been something big. And wasn't there a moment where their energies were actually like transferring to each other? I can't mm-hmm. remember what the context was, but I remember reading that and being like, this better not go. Where the, where the, where the hell I think it's going to go. And it, it did. did. It did. I'm I was, so sorry. I was, uh, I was really angry when I read that. I was really upset when I read mm-hmm. that. And not only because I loved Gideon's character. Okay, 90% because I really loved Gideon's character. <laughs> but also because there wasn't really anything, again, that solidified that they were at a point where they realized, oh, wait, I think I do love you. Mm-hmm. They were just at a point where they were barely becoming friends. Mm-hmm. So Hardly there. Mm-hmm. So it was it was sad. I did not want Gideon to die. I didn't I, I knew the name of the second book because my sister really likes this series. I know it was named Hero the Ninth for the second book. But if it weren't for the fact that that was the name of the second book, I would have thought that Hero would die and then we would see the other houses through Gideon helping the other necromancers. Mm-hmm. That's what I was kind of expecting. And I, 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 I kind of knew it was going to be a barrier gaze. From, yeah. like, the beginning. I just didn't know it was going to end like that. When literally Gideon's on the cover. Yeah. Hello, the main character? I know. She's going to die? Are you <laughs> kidding me? Does that mean that Harrow dies in the second book? I have no idea. And interesting, interesting, you bring up the second book. You didn't read the epilogue for this book. So Harrow goes and sees the Emperor. Mm-hmm. And she goes up to him and is bringing up, like, you know, I'm, I'm a lictor now. It's like, oh, congratulations! That's so great to hear. And it's like, no, there was this person named Gideon, and I, I've tried to bring her back, but I couldn't. And then the emperor's like, oh, really funny that you say that, because we did go in there and found the bodies of all the dead people, but there was no Gideon. And then she's like, well, what, what do you mean by that? And she's like, well, I don't know, but I can't help you. But if you wanted to train under me, maybe you can figure out how to bring Gideon back. And then that's how the epilogue ends with her going under the Emperor. And Harrow says, I'll be your lictor, Lord, if you'll have me. And the Emperor says, then rise, Harrow Hark the first. And that's how that ends. How do you feel about the possibility of them bringing Gideon back? I, I don't feel too bad about that, only because remember when they were in that old lab, in the labyrinth part of the mansion, or of the palace, mm-hmm. Gideon had found a piece of paper that had her name on it, but the paper was dated from thousands of years before, but she's just a regular person, so she's like, why the fuck would my name be on this? Yeah. So I feel like Gideon is more than what we've seen in the first story. There has to be something. Right. I don't know if they're going to bring her back, though. Do you think they would bring her back? Well, I mean, I didn't read the epilogue, but it sounds it sounds like that's what they're going for. Would you be upset if they brought her back? <sighs> no. I mean, okay. I think I would be, but eventually I'd forgive them if they were going to bring her back. One thing I disliked about this story, I know that it's dense, and that's kind of a thing with fantasy books, that they have to build the world for you to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I understand that. But I think one of the weak points that kind of turned me off of this book was the fact that there were so many fucking characters. Was there any other character, not counting the ninth house, that you liked? No one really stuck out as much as the two main characters but if i had to pick one probably dulcinea just because she was described as sickly Mm -hmm. and then gideon did feel kind of bad for her so she was the only one that i really thought about (laughs) wasn't there another lesbian couple though yeah but they ended up being messed up because remember one of them killed the other because that's what they thought it was oh my god i forgot about that (laughs) oh my god yeah that was sad I think my favorite character, characters, were the two youngest kids that were cavaliers Mm -hmm. that traveled with Gideon when they figured out, like, something bad was going on. Mm -hmm. And Gideon went underground with them. And the little boy who was with Gideon just 
there was an attack. He didn't react fast enough. And Gideon and the little girl ran away. And they closed the door. And the little girl's freaking out because she grew up with this kid. And it's like, we have to go back. We have to help him. But it's obvious that he's dead. Yeah. And then when they go to a safe space, Gideon takes a nap. And she wakes up. And then this little girl is dead. And it's like, fuck. They were just kids. Yeah. And that really, really got to me. Yeah. <laughs> Though yeah, that I was really, really sad. liked them. I really did like them. But just like because this world was so dense, the rest of the characters, except for the main two, were really forgettable. Because mm-hmm. even the character at the end, Camille, who lived and stuck with Gideon and Harrow, Camille. Yeah. I think it was Camille, yeah. Um, don't even remember her. When they were like, she's here, she's she's safe and i freaking see comments like yes camille queen i'm like who the fuck is camille, Who's I don't camille even know again how she's in i don't either yeah but the but, just the world was so dense yeah i agree i think in this type of book you remember when we were reading six, six of crows yes and you were taking notes yes i feel like i should have done that for this book just to keep track mm-hmm. of all of the characters where they came from and then just how I felt about them as they were being introduced. But then once they started fucking dying, I didn't want to get like too attached to yeah. anyone. I was scared. <laughs> um, last question that I have. And then we can say our overall thoughts if you don't have anything else to say. Okay. So there's a compelling argument to be made that the relationship between Harrow and Gideon is too toxic to root for or romanticize. And apparently this author does this a lot mm-hmm. where they bring up toxic relationships and try to argue the alternative which is although it's toxic there there is something deeper here what are your thoughts on that do you think it is too toxic to be a relationship just specifically hero and gideon yeah can i be honest yeah i just feel like with this story in particular i really wanted something sweeter between them to actually show that this that they meant more to each other than you know all of that jealousy and animosity i just wanted them to have more moments where they would actually talk about their emotions and how they maybe care about each other maybe yeah i wouldn't say i really shift them together because i didn't see enough love between them so or, it's more or any, honestly. <laughs> it's more so that than the toxicity of it. Yeah, I mean, some people do like a little bit of toxic in their relationship, which is fine. But for me, I just wanted it to be sweeter between these two characters in particular. You know, I'm on the opposite side of your thoughts mm-hmm. with I really did ship them. Okay. But the thing is, I completely agree with you. If this book had played out exactly the same... And got to the very end, but Gideon didn't die, and Harrow and Gideon would have kissed at the end. I would have hated that because that was built on nothing. Yeah. There was I no agree. romance between them. I agree. It was blossoming, but but nothing really slow enough to where it would not have impacted me. This was a slow burn, but too but, slow. But like nothing happened. <laughs> even if if Gideon's coming back, I don't even know how I would feel about that. Because what are Gideon and Harrow gonna say to each other when they see each other for the oh first time? Oh my God, time? you like sacrifice yourself for me wait do you like like me maybe but then like Gideon is not an emotionally I know like, I know she's not she doesn't wear her what is it hard on your sleeve yeah she's not that so how would that even play out I don't know but I did want them to end up together I did too but there was nothing there there was nothing of substance that I saw that I would think wow they actually really do love each other yeah so we've reached the end that was all I wanted to talk about. We've reached the end of our episode, and I know we missed a lot of details, specifically on the world building, and then all of the things that all Gideon... Fucking characters. Yeah, everything that Gideon and Harrow had to do to reach the end. But honestly, you're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> Read the book. I feel like we did talk about a lot of good points, though. Yeah. But I want you to guess how I felt about this book. Because for some reason, I feel like I know what you think you know. i think you would give it like a solid three okay is that what you thought at the beginning before we started filming Uh, i don't know because you kept mentioning and we'll say it at the very end you can tell me which one you thought it was you kept mentioning like i know which book is your favorite and for some reason i thought 
you thought this was my favorite. I thought it was like one of the top ones. Not the favorite favorite, but one of the tops. But honestly, I don't even like <laughs> after after the two first episodes that we did, I was like, I'm giving up on you. I'm not even gonna guess with you because you're so unpredictable with your ratings. So you But think... I did see your video, by the way. Hello? <laughs> I did... There's no privacy on TikTok. <laughs> You post one thing publicly and then all of a sudden you watch it. Hello? We share TikTok. Please follow us. Thank you. Story, story and, and things. S T O R Y N T H I N G S. I think you missed the end, but whatever. <laughs> but I did see your video, so you looked really emotional. So I assumed, okay, maybe it's like a four ish. But I knew you would agree with me about the romance aspect mm. that it just wasn't. It wasn't there. It was not. So I'm going to guess a solid three for you. For you. I love you. Oh, do you? I do. Thank you. I love you too. I've known you for 10 years. 10 full years. (laughs) Almost 10 full years in May. (laughs) And I know that you hate when things are too overly complicated. You don't like when things... She's calling me dumb. (laughs) No, I'm not. It's, It's more so like... You wish sometimes things were at face value and people didn't try to make meaning off of things that shouldn't have meaning. Exactly. I Mm. know that about you. Mm. And I feel like this book was a lot. And Mm. although you might have enjoyed reading it at the moment, or at least trudged along with it, (laughs) even if you did enjoy it, I don't think you would ever come back to this series. And I think you gave it a two. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so should I say mine first? You go first, yeah. So, my rating. I did actually really like this book, but not the first time I read it. Because mm-hmm. the first time I read it, I was in Arizona, and it was 2 a.m., and I read the first 50 pages, uh-huh. and I was not down. Like, I, I did not understand what was going on, and I know it wasn't my one brain cell. <laughs> it's just, like, the writing was so dense. Yeah. At the beginning, I just could not get into it. And... My second time reading it, I did really get into it, but because the world was so dense, I feel like I was missing what was going on. Mm-hmm. However, <laughs> I am very interested in this book. I did record a TikTok of me reading it, live reading it in one day. I know, I watched it. <sighs> Thank you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I can see myself reading the second book, and I really want to. I even recommended it for our next bulk read but you kind of gave me <laughs> i don't know i felt a little bit of um tension yeah there was a lot of tension us. <laughs> yeah so because of the things we mentioned in this podcast i think i'm going to give this a three out of five i did really like it i do not think i would read it again but i would read the second one okay thank you love that for you thank you <laughs> i just want to say that i disagree with you about me not loving things that are complicated okay because i really love fantasy and i love getting getting into different worlds i think how do i explain this i did enjoy reading this book but there are a couple of reasons why my reading is the way that it is there are certain tropes that i just really hate (laughs) and one of them being barrier gaze yeah And I did enjoy the story. I thought the world was cool. I liked reading about it. I am a little bit interested in reading the next one. Maybe not as much as you. My thing is I'm scared to know if she comes back because I don't know how I'm going to feel about it. If she does. Or if she doesn't. I don't know. Okay. But I did enjoy the story. Don't think I would read it again. But I would love to see this in like a tv series format hell yeah I think that would be, be cool i think that'd be really cool i might even read it again just for that yeah and i think i would rate it a 2.5 i told you i knew <laughs> it was gonna be a two i knew it and i didn't mean that you didn't like things that were complicated i just meant that when something feels like they're trying too hard you're just kind of like mm. when i first finished reading this book my rating was actually at like a 3.9 Oh my god. Yeah, I actually really liked when I, as soon as I finished it, but sometimes you need to let things marinate. Yes. <laughs> and the more that I thought about the, this book, the more upset that I became that the love wasn't actually progressed in the way that I wanted it to be progressed, or at least in the way that it's, you know, I don't even know if 
the author intended for it to be a romance between the two main characters or if people just ship them together. I think she did. Well, then that's why my rating is lower. (laughs) (laughs) That one, and I also lowered my rating because she died and it made me angrier the more I thought about it. You know what's funny? The first time I read this book, I would have thought that in this bulk read, it would have been my favorite. Really? Yeah. But then we started reading other ones. But then the hating game happened. (laughs) Oh my god. (laughs) The hating game? Two completely different stories. (laughs) I think we're done. I think we're done. Oh my gosh. Before we finish, if you did want to read the next one for the next bulk read, I am down. I love you. I love you. Oh Sorry, I'm so cold. Yeah, are you okay? No. Are you a vampire? Are you a vampire? I think I am, actually. Thank you for asking. <laughs> so thank you all for those of you who are listening to us in audio form, whether it be Spotify, Amazon, Music, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else you get your podcasts on. If you can leave a rating or a review, that would really help. Also, if you want to tell your friends, family, loved ones, and enemies about <laughs> us, that helps because the best way to get known is through word of mouth. If you listen to us and watch us on YouTube, um, like, comment, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell because that helps with analytics. I would really like to hear what all of you think about this book mm-hmm. because I am really excited to read the second one. Mm-hmm. I think it would be a really nice read. But we are going to go ahead and end our episode the way we end all of our episodes with a dice roll. What we do is we roll a dice and if it lands on an even number, we read a positive review. And if it lands on an odd number, we read a negative review. And these reviews, we are getting it off of Goodreads and we are not connected or affiliated with these people and their opinions. We are just going to read it and leave it in the air. Mm -hmm. So your number is a 10 positive all right well there's a lot of positivity on here Mm. what did it get overall 4.22 interesting interesting both of us rated it lower than that (laughs) are we me are we are we harsh critics welcome to the what's happening we figure it all out cast (laughs) (laughs) we figure out that we're bitches (laughs) are we just like what's happening i don't know bad to the bone Oh, I get it. <laughs> I don't Necromancers. Because they're in full circle. <laughs> By the way, we never really talked about the Necromancers this episode. Oh, well. <laughs> oh, well. Bone people. <laughs> Go ahead. So this is from Ashley on Goodreads. They rated it a 5 out of 5, and they said, My heart hurts. It aches. So incredible. I literally cried when it was over and as it was ending. I mean, that ending and this whole novel. Brutal AF. Perfection. Truly. Thank you so much for listening, and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye. So, did you buy the next one? I actually have it. <laughs> we can just do the next episode right now. <laughs> You're like, let's just do a we'll quick do read. We'll do a story and things. Read with me. Wait, that's cute. I'm not reading. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing the reading. <laughs>